week and I welcome you. Today we're going to listen to Bank Talk. It's joint between four people. Bobby Johnson, August Liu, Malena Schmidt and Neo Yin, they're all. You race at York University. Revival of continuous quantum walks on graphs using the Laplacian. Thanks, Sophia. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, today we'll be talking about Laplacian fractional revival on graphs. We were advised by Ada and Harmony who are here, and my name is Bobe, and I've been working with August, Melina, and Neo. So before we get started, we just wanted to give like a crash course on some of the theory behind what we've been doing. So we've been working with the Laplacian matrix, which we start with the adjacency matrix here for this path graph on three vertices. And then we construct the Laplacian by taking the diagonal degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. So this is our Laplacian matrix for this P3. Um, and then we've been dealing with continuous time quantum walks, which we uh, design the transition matrix for by taking the Laplacian to be the Hamiltonian of our system and taking the exponential, which is a standard Schrodinger equation solution. Um, and we call this our transition matrix or U of T. So there are a couple nice properties about the Laplacian that the adjacency doesn't have. Um, so zero is a simple eigenvalue on all connected graphs and the vector of all ones is the corresponding eigenvector. Um, the eigenvalues are bounded above by the number of vertices and the Laplacian is positive semi-definite. So all of its eigenvalues are non-negative. Um, we also use spectral decomposition, which just tells us that if we have a real symmetric matrix, which we take to be our Laplacian, then we can decompose it into the sum over the eigenvalues multiplied by their corresponding orthogonal projections onto their eigenspaces. Um, so these orthogonal projections satisfy a couple of nice properties that are once you project onto an eigenspace, if you project again, it doesn't do anything. Um, and if you project onto an eigenspace and then project onto an orthogonal eigenspace, you of course get zero out. So we call these Fs our principal idempotents. Um, so with our example of P3, again, we can take the eigenvalues of the Laplacian and then calculate the eigenvectors. And from this, we can construct our principal idempotents. Um, so with spectral decomposition, we know that summing over the idempotents will always give us out the identity matrix. Summing over the idempotents multiplied by their corresponding eigenvalues gives us our original Laplacian. Um, and then because the exponential is an analytic function, we can very strongly simplify our expression for the transition matrix by simply exponentiating the eigenvalues rather than exponentiating the entire matrix. Um, so in this project, we dealt with fractional revival, um, which just is something that occurs at a time t if the transition matrix takes on this block diagonal form, where the top left is a two by two block diagonal. Um, and this, the vertices indexed by the first two rows and columns are the vertices that are experiencing fractional revival. So there are a couple special cases. This is our most general. Um, we say that there's periodicity if this two by two block is the identity matrix. And there is perfect state transfer if we have this permutation matrix in the top left instead. So we are studying proper fractional revival, which basically covers all of this except for periodicity. So perfect state transfer and general fractional revival. Um, so in P3, we can use our spectral decomposition to construct the uh, transition matrix. Uh, and then if you plug in time two pi over three, you get out this block diagonal form where the first two entries are indexed, uh, index the end vertices of P3. So we see that there's proper fractional revival between the two end vertices of P3 at time two pi over three. 
if we plug in time to pi, we just get out the identity matrix, which tells us that the entire graph is periodic on all of its vertices. Um, so there's no PST or perfect state transfer on P3. So this is just an arbitrary graph that happens to exhibit perfect state transfer at time pi over two. Um, if you compute the transition matrix and then plug in time pi over two, you see in this bottom right corner that there is perfect state transfer between the last two vertices. And then the last concept that we used is something called strong cospectrality, which is a necessary condition for fractional revival. So we say that two vertices are strongly cospectral if the columns indexed by these vertices of every principal idempotent, F sub r, are either equal or additive inverses like this. So the most important consequence of this is that if two vertices are strongly cospectral, we can partition the eigenvalues into three sets. So the phi plus class represents the eigenvalues where the eighth and bth columns of the principal idempotents are equal. Um, the phi minus class represents the eigenvalues where the columns of the principal idempotents are equal but opposite. And the phi zero class represents the case where the columns of the principal idempotents are both equal to zero. So throughout the rest of this presentation, we'll just refer to these phi plus, phi minus, and phi zero classes as the standard partitions of eigenvalues. So again, in our P3 example, we see that all, uh, the two n vertices are strongly cospectral. Just by looking at our principal idempotents, we see here that the first two columns are equal, here they're additive inverses, and here they're equal again. So from this definition, we can partition the eigenvalues, <coughs> sorry, three, one, and zero into their corresponding phi plus, phi minus, and phi zero classes. Um, and furthermore, um, it has been shown that if you have two strongly cospectral vertices where the total number of vertices is greater than or equal to three, we see that the size of the plus class has to be greater than or equal to two and the size of the minus class has to be greater than or equal to one. So now August will talk a little bit about the characterization theorem. Hello. First of all, we would attempt to formulate a theorem that characterizes the occurrence of Laplacian fraction revival based on the Laplacian spectrum of the graph. Following a traditional series of tricks and proofs typically used to derive characterization theorems for quantum walk phenomena, we have derived the following characterization theorem for Laplacian fraction revival. So if X is a graph on more than two vertices, non-periodic Laplacian fraction revival occurs between A and B if and only if all the three following conditions hold. First of all, A and B needs to be strongly cospectral. The second condition is that given the strongly cospectrality and hence we have the partition, the uh, eigenvalues in the plus class and the minus class must be integers. The third condition corresponds to the non-periodicity. So if we have that the first two conditions hold instead of the third, we have periodicity instead of Laplacian fraction revival at two pi over g, um, which is not exactly what we want. So the third condition is if I take define g to be this weird looking GCD of things, where it's taken GCD over the differences where both eigenvalues are both in the plus class or the minus class, then I require g to not divide an eigenvalue equivalent equivalently all eigenvalues in the minus set. So I'll give you some time to read through this um, because we'll be using it later and we would remind you when necessary of what this is. Um, and if all the three following, uh, if all the three conditions hold, we have Laplacian, pro proper Laplacian fraction revival, which means non-periodic Laplacian fraction revival at tau equals to two pi over g. We won't get into the proof of this because the techniques used are quite standard, but just so that you'd be familiar with it, here's an example of applying it to the two n vertices of P3. So we have previously established that the two n vertices of P3 are strongly cospectral, and here is the partition of their Aiken values. So the first criteria is satisfied. The second condition that the plus and the minus class only have integers is also easily satisfied. And as for the third condition, we observe g equals to the GCD of three minus zero, which is three by observation. And indeed, three does not divide one, which is in the minus class. So we have that proper Laplacian fraction revival occurs specifically at two pi over g equals to two pi over three, which is what we have observed before from the calculations. 
you, um, from the characterization theorem, we have a few corollaries. First of all, G is not equal to one because if G is equal to one, it would divide everything in the minus class and the third condition would not hold. The second corollary is that if we have Laplacian proper fractional revival and then there are Laplacian periodic vertices at time two pi, we won't get into the details of this either. Um, the third condition is, uh, the third corollary is that we have been using the characteristic, characteristic theorem to produce a polynomial time algorithm that tests whether uh, there is Laplacian fractional revival on a certain graph. So Molina would now talk to you about what double cones are and um, how they display Laplacian fractional revival and to some extent uniquely. Okay, so hopefully I will find what a double cone is. Um, okay, so we start with a K2 complement, so an empty graph and two vertices, and then we take any other arbitrary graph Y and we take the join of that, which basically just means adding all the possible edges between those two graphs. Now we've been able to show that this is Laplacian fractional revival. So if G is a double cone, we're on N vertices, and the vertices of the K2 component are labeled by A and B, and G admits proper Laplacian fractional revival at time two pi over N between A and B. Um, I'll give a short outline of the proof. So in one of the earlier talks, um, equitable partitions were mentioned, and now we're dealing with almost equitable partitions, which basically means that we can partition our vertex set into three different sets. So the two top vertices of the double cone are in singleton classes, and the graph we joined them to is in a different class. And for it to be almost equitable, all we want is that we have the same number of edges between the sets in the sense that if we take any vertex in once any two vertices in a set and look at any other set, they need to have the same number of neighbors in that set. Now we can reduce that to a P3 in this case simply by shrinking the set to a single vertex and now we have to put a weight on the edges and that weight just corresponds to the number of edges going between the sets. And some more calculations then shows that we can show the plasma fractional value between the two end vertices of this P3 and then pull it up to the original double cone because those vertices were in singleton classes. Now, more interestingly is that kind of the reverse result. So if G is on more than two vertices and has proper Laplacian fractional revival at time two pi over N between vertices A and B, then G is a double cone, which kind of shows us that double cones are the only ones that can admit proper Laplacian fractional revival at this time. Now, I'll go into a little bit more detail on this proof. So we know that for any eigenvalue of the Laplacian, it's bounded between zero and N. Now, if we recall the definition of the GCD, we're looking at those differences of things both in the plus or both in the minus class. We are looking at Laplacian fractional revival at time two pi over n. So our g in this case is equal to n. So we also need a plus class to have at least size two. The only way we can have a diff of n in this case is if we have zero and n in the plus class. So that means we have fully defined our plus class. Now, because n is in a plus class, it's also an eigenvalue. So that implies that g is a joint graph. Um, I'll mention this proposition because it's useful, but I won't prove it. So if x has proper Laplacian fraction variable between two vertices a and b at time tau, with n tau being an integer multiple of two pi, then x complement has proper Laplacian fraction variable between the to the same. Now, if you recall, in our case, our time tau is 2 pi over n. So naturally, n times 2 pi over n is an integer multiple of 2 pi, so the proposition can be applied. So from this, is, it follows that a and b need to be in the same component. Uh, we can simply see that by 
imagining taking the complement of a join graph and then realizing that the two different things we joined will be two different connected components in the complement. Now, a popular plastic infection revival can only occur between two vertices that are in the same connected component. So for there be to be connect to be the plastic infection revival in the complement, we need to be them for them to be originally in the same part of the joint graph. Okay, so that's what we have so far. We have two different sets of vertices and they are joined in a joint graph and A and B need to be in the same set of vertices. Um, now we can get a contradiction characterization theorem unless she is a double kernel in this case. This can be seen by considering that we have proper Laplace infection revival in X complement. So because X complement has less than n vertices and um, the characterization theorem kind of tells us or has an implied corollary that the earliest time that Laplace infection revival occurs is at time 2 pi over the number of vertices. We can't possibly have Laplace infection revival at time 2 pi over n because x simply doesn't have that many. Okay. So what we have shown is that if we have Laplace infection revival at time 2 pi over n, then g is a double cone. This also has a nice kind of corollary that follows from the matrix tree theorem and the characterization theorem, simply by showing that p must be in a plus plus. So if g is a graph on a prime number p of vertices that has proper Laplace infection revival between vertices a and b, then g must be a double cone. So that implies that we have have characterized all the graphs that emit proper Laplace infection viable on a prime number of vertices. I will hand it over now to Neo, who will talk about trees. Hello, um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so in this section, we're going to talk about trees in particular. Um, uh, the, the reason why we're talking about trees is because trees are important for physics experiments related to fractional revival because they're sparse as minimally connected graphs. And a bit of history, Gabriel and Henry proved that no Laplacian perfect state transfer can occur on tree of three or more vertices. And, um, and we proved that uh, the more general fact that no Laplacian fractional revival on trees with um, four more vertices with four more vertices. That's because uh, P3 is the only tree on three vertices and it has Laplacian fractional revival, but not perfect state transfer. So the three becomes four here. Um, so the I'm gonna introduce the concept of oriented incidence matrix. I'm pretty sure everybody have seen this uh, before. So basically it is, you give this graph an orientation by for each edge assigning one of its end vertex as the tail and the other one as the head. So, so it's kind of like a vector. The, the head is plus, the, the tail is minus. And then you, you label your incidence matrix this way by identify, by making, by switching the sign um, of, of, of these edges. And so it doesn't really matter which orientation uh, one picks. What matters is that the Laplacian matrix is equal to the incidence matrix times its transpose regardless of the orientation. So we're going to go into the first crucial lemma is that if B is an oriented incidence matrix of a tree, it has to be a tree, um, for any integer that's greater than one, an integer, uh, integer vector x, if B times x is zero uh, reduced mod mu, then the vector itself has to be zero mod mu. When I say zero mod mu, I mean every entry is zero mod mu. So, um, so why is this true? Uh, the proof is by induction. Instead of the full proof, uh, it's using P4 that we have shown an example before is su suffices to illustrate this idea. So let X be an integer vector and mu be an uh, integer that's greater than one. Suppose that B times X is zero mod mu. Immediately you can see that uh, the first entry has to be zero mod mu. 
I think I hope that's clear from this. Um, and basically what you can do is now, because the first entry is zero mod mu, if you consider the instance matrix reduce mod mu, you can remove the person column. Um, and that corresponds to just pruning the vertex uh, corresponding to uh, number one. So that's what it looks like after the pruning. Uh, you have removed the vertex one. And now you consider the remaining, uh, you consider the remaining matrix. The, if you remove the first row and column, you get the instance matrix of the smaller graph. Um, and then you use the same argument again, you realize the second entry is zero mod mu. So again, we remove the first and column, a uh, first row and column and prune the vert leaf vertex two. And same argument. And eventually you go back down to ground zero and show that every entry is zero mod mu. So this argument actually works for every tree because uh, you can always find a leaf that you can use this pruning argument. We're lucky that on P4 we have this, we cooked it up in a sense that you have leaf everywhere. Every time you prune, you get a leaf, but by some permutation of the, uh, the matrix, you can get, uh, you can always put the leaf at the front and you'll see that immediately. So this induction argument works for all trees. So this is very important. So the next lemma we're gonna prove is that if AB are strongly co-spectral vertices in the tree, then any integer eigenvalues in the minus class must divide two. Uh, notice that not, it's not true that every element in the minus class must be an integer. If you only have strong co-spectrality, you need fractional revival to say that the minus class have only integers. But in case you, if you do have an integer, that must divide two. And we can sort of see how this will eliminate trees. Um, last night, actually, August sent me a, sent me a message. He's like, oh, we have a, we have a diff different way to do it because originally we need, the, we need to prove power of two first and then prove divides two. But then right now we can prove dividing two directly. Um, and the proof goes as follows. So let mu be an integer in the minus class. If it's equal to one, then we're done because one divides two. Um, so let's suppose that it's not one. That means we can take an eigen, so something that we can do, this is a fact that, uh, that is used in Gabriel and Henry's paper, is that we can use, we can pick an eigenvector y of, of the eigenvalue mu with, in, with only integer entries such that their GCD is equal to one. And the reason being that the Laplacian matrix is, consists of only integers and your eigenvalue is integer. So you can, you can just use this uh, row reduction to solve for eigenvector that, that has only rational entries. And then you can sort of neutralize the denominator by multiplying their LCM. And then you get an integer eigenvector. And then you can reduce them uh, by the GCD that way. So this is why you can find such a vector. Uh, so notice that the Laplacian matrix times this vector is zero mod mu. And in particular, we have the instance matrix times B transpose times Y uh, is zero mod mu, which means we can use the lemma we just proved. So that means B transpose Y is zero mod mu by the lemma. Um, and what is, what is B transpose Y? Basically, it's indexed by the edges in your graph. Uh, and for every edge UV, let's suppose it's oriented from U to V, um, then the, the corresponding entry in that B transpose Y vector is just the difference between, it's just the V entry minus the U entry of Y. So this B transpose corresponds to the difference between the entries. So because the graph is connected, your edge goes through the whole graph. So the difference between any two entry of Y is zero mod mu. I hope this is clear. Um, so, so that means every single entry reduced mod mu is equal. Uh, for, for, and they're equal to k mod mu for some integer k. Notice that the GCD of k and mu must be equal to one. This is because any common divisor of, uh, of k and mu must, be a, must divide all entries in y. And because the GCD of all these entries equal to one, then that means the GCD of k and mu must be equal to one. So uh, therefore the GCD of any entry in the vector and mu must be equal to one. Um, and, and this is just because they're equal to k mod mu. In particular, the eighth entry, the GCD of eighth entry and mu is equal to one.
Okay, so uh, also so this is something that we know. We know that the eighth entry plus the beth entry is zero because by the definition of the minus class, um, and there's zero mod mu, there, and we know that their difference is zero mod mu. So we can add these two equations together and we got two times the eighth entry is zero mod mu, um, which means mu divides two uh, times the eighth entry. And because the GCD of the eighth entry and mu is equal to one, as we saw in the last slide, uh, mu must divide two. Mu cannot divide because GCD is equal to one, so mu must divide two. So we're done with this proof. So we proved that any integer eigenvalue in the minus, cl minus class must divide to. If you have a Laplacian fractional revival between A and B, then the minus class contains only integers. Therefore, you only have two cases left to consider, which is the minus class consists of precisely one and two, or the minus class have only one element. And we show both are impossible. So recall that the characterization theorem, the G cannot be equal to one. The GCD of difference cannot be equal to one. Um, because otherwise you will have periodicity and not proper Laplacian fraction revival. Uh, but if it's if minus class is one and two, then the GCD of difference must be one because two minus one is equal to one. So condition three fails. So this is not a possible scenario. If uh, it has only one element, uh, Gabriel and Henry actually show that if this is the case, then AB are twin vertices, meaning that they share the same set of neighbors. And but in trees, only a pair of leaves can actually share the, can, can only a pair of leaves can be twin vertices, can have the same neighbors. Uh, but something that we can show is that on the graph with more than four vertices, Laplacian fractional revival cannot occur between leaves because um, if you have Laplacian fractional revival, their degree has to be at least two. Uh, and I won't show the proof here. The proof is pretty tedious. Uh, it's pretty much just writing out the expression and pulling and factoring out things and and you eventually you realize that you get, you, get this, um, you get this condition. So this means that AB cannot be leaves. And that means basically that when your number of vertices is more than four, there is no Laplacian fractional level on the tree. Um, and there are only two trees with four vertices, which is one of the, the, uh, the first one is a star. And the second one is the path and none of them have Laplacian fractional level. It's pretty easy to check. So basically we show there's no Laplacian fractional level on trees with four or more vertices. And the only tree that emit La FR are P2 and P3. Okay, so we're done with this. I'll pass it to Bobby now. Okay, hi. So after we eliminated Laplacian fractional revival on trees, we looked to some way that we could maybe rescue this idea of fractional revival on trees with something pretty close to fractional revival, but not quite. Um, so this is a graph on the graph P5. So this is the sum of the squares of the moduli of the 1, 1 entry and the 1, 5 entry. So if this ever equals exactly 1.0, then you have fractional revival between the first and fifth vertices. Um, but P5 is a tree on more than four vertices. So we've proven that it never has fractional revival. But if you look right here, for instance, it gets like arbitrarily close to 1.0, but not quite. Um, which introduces this idea that we might want to find fractional revival as a limit point of a sequence of times rather than having a specific time where it achieves it. So fractional revival was defined as the transition matrix having some time tau such that you get this block diagonal matrix where this is a two by two. So pretty good fractional revival is almost the same thing, but we incorporate this idea of sequence of times. So we define the sequence of times T sub K, and then we say that there's pretty good fractional revival if as you take the limit as K goes to infinity, the limit of the transition matrix is this block diagonal matrix. So for the rest of today, we'll be talking about PGFR or a pretty good fractional revival. So we'll talk about how we derive the characterization theorem and then Neo and I will talk about how we found two infinite families of graphs that exhibit pretty good fractional revival, but not regular fractional revival. So it's a consequence of Kronecker's approximation theorem that there's Laplacian pretty good fractional revival between two strongly co-spectral vertices, if and only if, for all integers L sub J that satisfy this equation, summing over the plus and minus classes of eigenvalues of the integers multiplied by the eigenvalues equals zero, 
then summing over the minus class of the integers does not equal plus or minus one. So we want to classify, or we want to classify which paths have PGFR using this characterization. Um, and we're able to show that the path graph on n vertices has PGFR between its end vertices if and only if the number of vertices is a power of a prime number. So it was previously proven that PN has pretty good state transfer, which is the pretty good analog of perfect state transfer between end vertices if and only if the number of vertices is a power of two. So the cool case here is when P is an odd prime. So to use the characterization, we need the spectrum. So this is the spectrum of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of PN. And then where A and B are the end vertices, we can partition the eigenvalues into their phi plus and phi minus classes. So if N is odd, the phi plus class is zero and the eigenvalues indexed by odd J and the minus class is all of the others, which are just the even Js. Um, and in the even class, it's just the, or when N is even, it's just the opposite. So the phi class, phi plus class is zero unioned with lambda j where the j's are even, and the phi minus class is where the j's are odd. So using this, we can have the characterization theorem specifically for pn. So basically to show there's pretty good fractional revival, we have to take arbitrary integers that satisfy this. Um, and if n is odd, we have to show that summing over the even class does not equal plus or minus one. And if n is even, then we have to show that summing over the odd class does not equal plus or minus one. So first we let n equal a power of an odd prime. So we set up this polynomial L of x, where we start with this arbitrary set of integers such that when you sum over the integers by the eigenvalues, you get zero. Um, and then I just plugged in two plus two cosine for the each eigenvalue and you get this equation equal to zero. Um, but we also know how to express cosine in terms of complex exponentials. So we just took the root of unity zeta sub two n, plugged in for cosine of pi j over n um, into our expression here. And then we just took the root of unity and replaced it with an x. So now we have this polynomial L of x um, and by construction, it has this root of unity zeta sub 2n as a root. So then we know a couple of things about this polynomial. So as I just mentioned, we know that the cycle or zeta sub 2n has to be a root. Um, and then we also know because it's a root of unity, we can classify the minimal degree irreducible polynomial that has zeta sub 2n as a root, which is the cyclotomic polynomial. Um, and because this is the minimal degree irreducible polynomial, um, we know that the cyclotomic polynomial must perfectly divide this polynomial we constructed L of X. So then we can factor L of X into the product of our cyclotomic polynomial and some other arbitrary integral polynomial G of X. And then it turns out that if you just plug in negative one, everything comes out quite nicely. So if you plug in negative one for L of X, you get out four times the sum over the even J's without zero. Um, and then the cyclotomic polynomial evaluated at negative one just gives you this prime P and then it's multiplied by G evaluated at negative one. Um, and then if you divide both sides by four, you see that the only way that this can equal plus or minus one is if this prime P is divisible by four, um, which is impossible since P is an odd prime. So therefore on powers of odd primes, we have that there is pretty good fractional revival. Um, so we can also show that all other cases, there is not pretty good fractional revival. I'll just go through one case now, which is when n is even, but not a power of two. So here, because n is even, we want to show that the sum over the odd class of integers equals plus or minus one for some set of integers. Um, so I set n equal to mk, where one is odd and one is even. And then it was shown that the eigenvalues of pn satisfy this combination equal to zero. Um, so we have this integer combination of eigenvalues. And then if you simply extract the odd j and then sum over them, you get plus or minus one regardless of what k is. So this tells us that there is no pretty good fractional revival in this case. So before I hand it off to Neo, basically what we talked about so far is that we were able to fully characterize pretty good fractional revival in the Laplacian case. And then on paths, it was already shown that there's pretty good perfect state transfer on powers of two. And then we were able to generalize it to pretty good fractional revival when it's powers of odd primes. Hello? 
Oh, can you hear, can you hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, so another family of um, trees actually that we have classified in terms of its Laplacian PGFR is, uh, is are the double stars. And the funny thing is actually we can show that, uh, okay, I'll talk about the funny thing after. But uh, so, so a double star is basically a graph that you can get by attaching n leaves to one side of a P2 and then n leaves on the other side. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, as you can see in those three pictures. And um, so there are only two types of strongly cospectral, I mean, two types of double stars that do have strongly cospectral vertices. The first case is called the, are the balanced double stars, S, M, and N, uh, or the other case is S, 2, N. In the case of M, S, M, and N, you have strongly cospectral vertices, these two central vertices, and nothing else. Uh, in the S2 and M case, you have strongly cospectral vertices between the two leaves on one side, um, and nothing else. And in the case where S N and M, uh, when N not equal to M greater than equal to three, they don't have strongly cospectral vertices. And S2 and two is funny; it's a hybrid of the two cases, so it has. Um, strongly cospectral vertices for all of the above. And S1 and 1 is just a path on four vertices, which we have just studied. So this is how strongly cospectral vertices look like. And, and the, how do we prove that? The idea <coughs> is to use almost equitable partition. And basically, you can collapse the, uh, the tr this guy, the double star, and then you obtain some simpler graph. And you realize that strong cospectrality is preserved under uh, singleton identifications. Just like, um, just like a Laplacian fractional rival. So that's the idea. But I won't show the details because kind of tedious. So the case of S, M, and M is we'll talk about later. Let's start with a more interesting case, which is S two and M. Uh, we have strong cospectrality between the two leaves. Let's just call them A, B for simplicity. Um, I hope the color is not distracting and hope this is helpful. Uh, some computation will tell us that the characteristic polynomial of S2n is given by this guy. Uh, and a pain-free way to compute this is, is to use the almost equitable partition. Um, so if you look at the cubic factor, which is colored blue, by analysis argument, we can show that the cubic factor is irreducible when n is not equal to 2. And the way you do it is to realize this is a sort of arithmetic sequence of polynomial. And then so they have fixed points. And then you use that to, to bound your roots. And you're able to show it's irreducible. And you know that it has three distinct positive real roots, distinct from many ways to see, I guess, cardinals. You can use the discriminant. Uh, positive real roots because of positive definiteness. Um, and something you can show is that they both belong to the plus classes because of a pure for B's theorem argument, because it contains the largest um, eigenvalue. But I won't go into the detail. We know that the plus class take out zero because we don't care about zero um, is e to one, two, and three, where there are the three distinct real roots of that cubic, and the minus class is just one. Um, so that's that's helpful. I'm going to color the minus class plus class differently just so they're apparent in the in in the later argument. So let these four arbitrary integers r l1 up to l3 be such that you have this linear combination equal to zero just like in the characterization theorem since one is the only eigenvalue in the minus class uh with the corresponding integer r what we really want to show if we want to show laplacian pgfr is that r is not equal to plus minus one so that's the goal and so you permit you shuffle it a little bit you get l the sum equal to minus r by Galois theory argument. Uh, this is because you have this cyclic um, subgroup of the Galois extension because you have an irreducible cubic. You can obtain that, uh, you can sort of apply it to the coefficient, you can apply to this equation, you can shuffle the, the coefficients. Uh, hopefully that's clear. And cyclically, and you get these three sort of analogous equations and you can add all of them together and you get that, you get this equal to negative three R. And you know that the sum of these eta one, two, three is N plus six because they are roots of this cubic and N plus six is the coefficients that, 
that corresponds to the sum. And you have that R is equal to negative L1 uh, sum up to L3 times N plus six over three. And that is never equal to plus minus one. So uh, by the characterization theorem, when M is not equal to two, which corresponds to the cases where the cubic is irreducible, there is la PGFR on S2 and M between the two leaves AB. So, so that's how we show that. Um, in the case of S, M and M, we can actually easily show that there is no Laplacian PGFR between the two strongly cospectral central vertices. And, and that's pretty simple because in this case, you only, the roots are, you, you know the roots in explicit form, unlike the cubic case where you can't really solve it nicely. In this case, you only have quadratics, so it's very easy to check um, that you have the Laplacian PGFR, so I won't show the proof here. So this is the summary of the classification. Um, La PGFR occurs on S, N, and N, if and only if one of the cases hold. Uh, the first case is when you have a balanced double star, you have La PGFR between the two central vertices. And the second case is when you have two and N, you have Laplacian PGFR between the two leaves on on the side corresponding to n equal to two. Uh, the thing is, uh, in the in the S2 and 2, 2 hybrid case, you actually do not have, you can show explicitly that you do not have uh, la PGFR between the leaves. You only have it between the two central vertices. And that's another just computation. Um, and in the case of S1 and 1, which is P4, we do have la PGST because four is a power of two, as we have seen before. So that is the, end of the, the classification of double stars. And the funny thing is that um, not only, so, so these are trees that don't have Laplacian fractional revival, but they do have approximate fractional revival. What's more funny is uh, you, know, you actually know that path, um, except trivial cases of P2 and P3, I believe, don't even have periodicity. And this is something we also proved in our work, but we didn't show it here. That's only because of, uh, integer eigenvalue condition. And same thing with double star. Um, at least the cases we see that do have Laplacian fraction rival, you see this eta one, two, three, not integers in the plus class, you also know they don't have uh, Laplacian periodicity, but they do have, uh, they're good counterexample to, uh, to, to some things, to things, right? So that's, um, that's a funny fact. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, I, I have a couple. <laughs> um, first one, you got the um, the double cone. You get um, factor revival at, at two pi on n. It looks to me like there might be some lower bound on the time for factor revival um, for passing FR. Let's say um, of the form say two pi over the maximum valency. Do you have any feeling about that? Um. So that's what I mentioned at the end of the proof. So because of the bound on the eigenvalues, it's actually the earliest time when we can have Laplacian factor arrival at time two pi over n, simply because we need the plus class to be. Um, so the plus class must have at least two integer eigenvalues in them. So the biggest difference we can get there is having zero and n in there, just because the Laplacian eigenvalues are bounded above by n. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether that's a re an answer to my question. I mean, so what I'm really asking is how fast can you get the passing that far if you go away from double cones? How fast we can get the passing fraction revival if it's not a double cone? Yeah. Um, my actual question is uh, a little stronger, but that, this will do as a starting point. Now, I mean, you don't have to have an answer, I mean, but I just, you, you've looked at the example, so you might have a bit of information that I haven't come across. Um, well, um, the time we presented is the earliest time. Um, so if you know the spectrum, that's uh, probably a easy question, but um, in other cases, we are not completely sure. 
um, from just a graph if we just use um, statistics according that you I guess you're choppy. <clears throat> and then, uh, something, I think one of Melina's conjecture, which we have improved, is that G must divide N. And G must actually be, I think, G, Melina, you showed that G must be less than N, right? Um, the, the GCD of difference must be less than N. That means uh, 2 pi over N is actually always the fastest time you can have it. Um, because G must be less than N. Is that true, Melina? Well, G well, must be GCD, so yes. Okay, yeah, so so that that's that. And also, if you consider arbitrary graph, you can actually make it arbitrarily fast because I think uh, in a paper by Ada uh, and and others, uh, there, there's, this, um, there's this family of graphs developed using association scheme that have, I think, two pi, pi over two k something, something along that line where um, you can be very, very close to zero. But that's not given if you fix a graph. So but in those examples of eta's, there is a lower bound on the time, which is of the form um, two pi over twice the valency, if I recall correctly. Okay. So the, the, the oh, question- Yeah, we don't have a bound like that. But, um, now, that's not in the ADIS paper, but it's the, there is such a bound. Um, that's why, one reason why I'm asking whether there's a, a, a bound on the time um, of the form pi over some function of the valency. Um, and I think, I think we need to, to across examples. Yeah, I think we need to kind of look up uh, our computation and, 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 and answer your question, Chris. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, in a certain sense, I was asking what you had in the way of example. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, I think this bound comes from the fact that in the adjacent matrix, the eigenvalues are between the valency and minus the valency. Yeah. So any bound for for FR now here will have to do with any bound you can get for the Laplacian matrix. And what Malina mm -hmm. said is that they are between zero and n. So that's crude, I know. But if you can improve that for some classes, then you can improve the bound in time, I think. Yeah. And is it, I think there's a, there's a, bound based on the degree of the largest eigenvalue of the Laplacian. There's a relation, um, which I cannot recall off the top of my head, maybe August note, um, and that could be potentially very helpful. Well, we also proved a relationship between the largest eigenvalue in the plus set and the degree, um, a inequality, which would be useful to generate a minimal time, but I don't, don't know if that's gonna be um, very, very powerful. What examples do you have of the Laplacian factory viral on bipartite graphs with at least four vertices? We have um, a class of almost bipartite graphs, basically um, no, 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 a bipartite no, no. bipart graph between, no, 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 no. Um, between M and N vertices, where um, we, and then you add an edge to one of the classes. If you have um, to yeah. one of, to either the class of N, um, to, to either the class of N vertices or the class of N vertices. And if you have that the GCD between M and N is at least three, then you have a Laplacian factor of viable between A and B. Yeah, but I'm not- um, You can use almost equitable partitions to generalize this as well. Yes, but I'm not, I definitely want to focus on my part of graphs. Oh, no. Okay, because when the argument you're using to prove the, the first, when you do proving that there's no, Laplacian FR on trees, the first step is to, uh, to prove a fact about the instance matrix. Um, and that fact holds for bipartite graphs and not just for trees. Okay, so the, the jargon is that the instance matrix the, of an orientation of a bipartite graph is totally unimodular. Okay, and so the argument you're using there for trees will hold actually, the theorem is actually true for bipartite graphs. Um, are you referring to the um, oriented yeah. incident matrix fact? Yes. yes. Um, would that also, would that hold for any um, graph with a cycle? Is it my holds question. for bipartite graphs. It breaks down. Um, you can get, so it, for, for bipartite graphs, the instance matrix is totally, the jargon is, I said, is totally unimodular. 
And so you get the result that you, you get the theorem that you were writing down. If the graph's not bipartite, so for an odd cycle, that result's not true. Okay, but so the point is that it's true for bipartite graphs. And so that made me wonder is that maybe some of the stuff that you're doing for the trees can be pushed to a, um, a larger class of graphs. I don't think it holds for even cycles. I think even cycles are totally unimodular. Um, Okay. Well, I guess we were looking we look at think some discussion about the actual theory we need, but the, what I'm saying is that for bipartite graphs, that matrix is totally unimodular, and so you'll get a lot of what you were doing for trees in that situation. We still have one week in this program, so something to do for this week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was, that was a very nice talk. So anyway, I should have started by saying that you did a very good job of presenting your stuff. I was very impressed. I had a really crowd. <laughs> Thank you.